D. Though the men police need to interview could come from anywhere in Britain. Two months ago, on Monday the 8th of May, a shopkeeper was attacked in his own shop in Union Street in the city centre. Gordon Johnston died from his injuries. He was married with two children aged 12 and 9. Many of the witnesses to the events that day have taken part in our reconstruction. Dundee, with its famous bridge across the Tay, attracts shoppers from around the east of Scotland. At the heart of the shopping centre is Union Street, and one of the oldest shops there is Gow's for guns and fishing tackle. How's the family? Very well, actually. It's Alistair, I'm in about I'm looking for a gun for him. He's joining the gun club. Something to get... Gordon Johnston had been working here since he left school at the age of 16 in 1955. He began as an assistant and had now become manager and sole employee. That's perfect. How much is that? 29.95. Can I bring him in and let him have a look at it? Ah, oh, yes. I'll put it aside for you. That'd be fine. OK, Mr Lawson. Bye now. Thanks. Bye-bye. It's Monday, May the 8th. Gordon took the 9A route each day to travel into town, and on that morning, regular passengers remember him as usual. He was seen getting off the bus opposite Burton's at about 8.45 that morning, and he then walked along the Nethergate to the shop. Shortly before nine, he was seen removing the grills that protect the windows, but he left the grills on the door. Then, before opening the shop to customers, Gordon went on a couple of errands. Morning. At the gas board showroom, the till receipt shows he dropped in to pay his bill at three minutes after nine. That's three pounds and seven pounds. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Mr. Johnson then went shopping. Gordon Taylor, a bank employee, met him back near Gow's. He glanced up at the church clock and remembers it was 9.14. About then, another witness was heading up Union Street. Well, I went to the bakers and did some messages, and I walked up past the shop, and as I was passing the man bending down, I heard a remark. I slept in this morning. And there was two men at the window who may be speaking to a salesman phoned Gow's sometime between 9.15 and 9.20, and someone answered. Ah, oh, good morning. It's Mr Travers of Hotmore Clothing. Look, uh, we have a new range of outdoor jackets, and I think you'd be... Mr Travers doesn't know who he spoke to, but assumed it was Mr Johnson. He thinks whoever answered was used to dealing with reps and described him as sounding middle-aged. Yeah, fine, mm -hmm. Well, well, actually, I'll be up in Dundee later today, so is it all right if I drop by? Ah, oh, that's great. That's fine. Well, look, I'll see you later. John Richmond is the postman for the district. He was surprised to find Gow's shut and was unable to deliver the mail. We know that was at 9.24, since a few doors up, he crossed the road to Henderson's Jewellers and was recorded on their security camera, which shows a clock. By this time, the town was filling up, and police need to hear from anyone who visited the area of the Nethergate and Union Street. The first shopper known to visit Gow's that morning was John Bishop. Came down Union Street to go into Gow's to buy some fishing tackle. So I tried the front door, it was locked. I looked at my watch, it was 9.38. A man's head appeared from behind the shop door. And as I turned to walk down the street, his head appeared again. He didn't seem concerned that he'd seen me at all. A few minutes later, Marion Davidson went to the shop. As she tried the door, she heard a voice. She didn't have time to wait and went to work. Kenneth Hasty was walking up Union Street and so was Linda Galozzi. When Linda drew level with Gow's, she saw a man acting suspiciously, and she stopped to watch. He seemed to be having trouble locking the door. That was suspicious. Yeah.
some people were ignorant. Mr. Hasty remembers that the man disappeared behind a red van parked outside Scott's bar. So when, what, Inside the bar, was? the owner was talking to a member of her staff. Are you open? No. At the other end of Union Street, on the Nethergate, Mickey Liddell was driving into town when a man ran right out in front of him. By 4.30, a customer had become so concerned, he'd summoned the police. They discovered Gordon Johnston's body. His watch had been smashed and had stopped at 21 minutes past the hour. In fact, the hour hand was broken in the attack, but presumably it was 21 minutes past nine, which means that it's very important to identify those two men who were seen looking through the, looking into the shop window a little bit earlier. Indeed, yes. One is described as in his late 30s and five feet nine inches in height. The other is smaller and described in his 20s. He's of stouter build than the first one. Now, one of the witnesses, as we saw in the reconstruction, actually saw a face inside the shop. Yes, unfortunately, it's only half a face because, as you would see in the film, the window was obscured and we could only see the, the witness could only see the top part of the man's face. He describes him as being 40 to 50 years, 5 foot 9 inches in height, slim build and pointed, craggy features. Even so, it's with, quite, a, quite a detailed crime watch video fit, that. It is, yes. Now, we've got an even more detailed one, or at least uh, we've got a more complete video fit because this is the man seen running away from the shop. That's right. Or at least walking is, away briskly. This man carrying a gun case is described as 25 years, again 5 foot 9 inches in height, of average build and sharp features. He had dark collar length hair and he was wearing light denim jeans and witnesses have described his clothing as either a light uh, anorak, which was dark blue in colour, or a jerkin and it had a hood, but this hood may have been attached to an undergarment. OK, it's quite similar to the video fit that we saw, the half video fit earlier. Now, it also is quite similar to a man who was picked up by that security camera in the jeweller's shop shortly after 9 o'clock, isn't it? That is correct, yes. What time was, was this uh, taken? This? this was shortly after 9 at the same jeweller's shop, and it may have been that this man uh, was innocently going to a railway station, a bus station or whatever, but we haven't traced them and it's imperative that we do. Here it is again. We'll freeze on that point. Now, if that was you, and if you were innocently going about your business that morning, a little bit after nine o'clock, please do call us right away now. There was uh, a clasp knife found as well. This, outside Scott's Bar, which is on the route that uh, the man was seen walking away fairly briskly. You suspect this might have been stolen from Gowers? Yes, Mr Johnson did sell such knives, but unfortunately we cannot say how many have been stolen, or indeed this is the only one. So if anybody was uh, offered uh, an Opinel French clasp knife in suspicious circumstances, particularly in the Tayside area, you need to hear from them. That is correct, yes. Now, he was a popular man in the vicinity, and I know local people have been very upset, let alone the family. Very much, yes. They've, they've got together a reward? Yes, uh, the proprietors of the shop and their associates in the area have put forward a reward of £12,000 for information which will lead to the arrest and the conviction of the person or persons who have committed this crime. OK, well, we know that Mrs Johnston and the children are watching tonight. If you think in any way you can help, here's the number to ring in the studio. It's 01811 8055. Or you can ring Tayside Police at Dundee Direct on 0382 23200. Robbery. Lothian and Borders Police, who asked for our help, say it was a miracle that no one was hurt in the affair. The reconstruction you're about to see is as accurate as possible, given eyewitness accounts. The robbers you see are, of course, actors, but they resemble eyewitness descriptions. Remember, people's memories aren't infallible, and no doubt it will emerge that some of the details turn out to be different. If you can give more information, or if you saw anything to do with the robbery, please do call us. It happened three months ago in Edinburgh. The date is Friday the 1st of March. 
the people of Edinburgh are to witness an extraordinary chase through the main streets of the city. This is Waterloo Place in the centre of Edinburgh. At 4.30pm, this blue Ford Cortina with three men inside stopped opposite the Edinburgh housing offices. The car had been stolen from Glasgow the day before. One man stayed outside and one went inside as though he was a council tenant here to pay his rent. But instead of going to the counter, he sat with cleaners who were waiting for the offices to close. Several minutes later, a Securicor van arrived to collect the day's takings from the cashiers, leaving a guard to keep watch in the back of the van. Normally, the guards would have collected the money and come straight out, but today the cashiers weren't ready and there was a 15 minute wait. This long delay enabled witnesses in the building to give a very full description of one of the robbers. He seemed about 30 years old, six feet tall, well built with black straggly unwashed hair and a scruffy moustache. He had a pale complexion. It's now 4.45 p.m. It seems that by looking through the window into the cashier's office, the accomplice outside was able to give a signal that the guards were about to emerge. Get down! Get down! Attack, 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 394, Housing Department, Waterloo Place. Get down! Hold on, get down! The second impact caused the van to swerve and hit a parked car. As the Cortina sped down the Royal Mile, the robbers found they were on their own. For the moment, they'd got away. Right. At 
the bottom of the Royal Mile, they swerved right into the car park of Scottish and Newcastle breweries. The van had lost them from its sight and drove straight past. Over a dozen witnesses saw the men running through the car park. Several said that one was now wearing a bright red sweater. The Securicor van had lost them, and with a burst radiator, it had to give up the chase. Inspector Tom Snedden is the man, the detective now hunting for the robbers. How can the public help? Well, I would ask anyone who witnessed the robbery or the subsequent chase through the streets of Edinburgh to contact us if we've not already interviewed them. Now, as we said, we've got a very good description of at least one of the, one of the robbers. Just, just tell us again what we know about him. I think it's important to emphasise the point that uh, the men are actors. The description of the gunman, he's about six feet, approximately 30 years of age. He's well built, he was unshaven, he's got a moustache, He's got black straggly hair, it's unwashed, falling over his forehead. We know for a fact that he was wearing a blue parka jacket with a hood which is trimmed with fur. Right, and the second man? The second man and the third man, they're both rather patchy, the, the descriptions. The second man's approximately 25 to 30 years. He's 5 feet 7, he's well built. He's unshaven, he's possibly got a beard. He was wearing a ski cap, either brown or green, and a green jacket. The driver, who's the third man, he, in fact, has got short hair, he's about 27. He's clean-shaven, but we do have witnesses speaking to the fact that he's possibly got a bad complexion, pockmarked or spotted face. Now, you mentioned things that they were wearing. Uh, on the other hand, when we saw them in the last shot, as they were escaping from the car park, one of them, it seemed, was wearing a bright red pullover as they ran off into Hollywood Road. That's correct. Um, we believe that, in the fact, they've changed clothes in the car. You would also notice that uh, they were only carrying one bag, because uh, there was four bags stolen, and we believe they've put them into one whole doll. Right. Now, presumably, you lost sight of them after the car park, so you want anybody who might have seen suspicious people running away beyond that point? That is correct. Anyone in a red, uh, wearing a red jersey or carrying a whole doll in the area of Holyrood Road Right. Come forward. Now, I mentioned that the car had been stolen from Glasgow the day before, which was, if I remember correctly, February the 28th. Uh, it was stolen in Glasgow, the, the registration number, I've got it here, SSF701V. Yes. Now, you need to know more about that car, presumably, where it was in the intervening 24 hours. The car was stolen from Langside College Car Park, which is near Battlefield Road in Glasgow. It was stolen approximately between 7.30pm and 9pm and we would appeal to anyone who saw the car between these times and the time of the robbery to come forward. Right, so it's the car you need to trace in that intervening 24 hours, though you've obviously got it back now. Yes. You need to find any of the three men responsible. You want to see anybody who saw the chase, whether or not they feel they have anything important to tell you? That is correct, because the, these men could be from any part of the country and uh, not necessarily from Edinburgh, and I would appeal to anybody who, in fact, uh, either knows the men from the descriptions or think they know them to contact uh, myself or the uh, numbers given, and they can speak to us in confidence. All right, Inspector Snedden, thank you. Um, the number to ring, if you can help, is 01811 8055. Or you can call Lothian and Borders Police directly on Edinburgh 311 3131. Turned to tragedy for 20 year old Paul Sheldon. Paul was an art student and had gone out on Friday evening, the 6th of February, for a few drinks with his brother and a friend. In the early hours of Saturday morning, they were making their way home along White House Lone in the Brunsfield area of the city when they were confronted by these two men. A scuffle broke out, and after a chase, Paul was stabbed to death. This is the man with the knife. He's between 18 and 20, about 5 foot 9, with deep sunken eyes and possibly wearing a woolen ski hat, a sweatshirt and baggy jeans. The other man was a little older, 20 to 22, 6 foot, well built with black hair. 
If you recognise either of these men or can help in any way, you can call Lothian and Borders Police Headquarters in Fetis Avenue on 031 311 3535. Reconstructions is a case that's been headline news in Scotland, the disappearance of Linda Hunter. Some stories have associated Linda with the missing London estate agent Susie Lamplew, but police have no reason to link the two women, except that they're both missing. Maybe in Linda's case, it's a mystery that you can help resolve. The story starts near the Hunter's home, Carnoustie, 12 miles from Dundee. Thursday, August the 20th. Every day, Linda Hunter drove to the golf course to exercise her dog, Shep, on the nearby beach. Linda was generally in high spirits. she just discovered she was pregnant. She worked at a residential home for the elderly in Dundee, but she and Shep were inseparable. She always took him with her. Though only 30, Linda was second in charge of the home, a job that frequently involved working nights. At 6.30 that Thursday evening, Linda phoned her mother. I'm all right, but I'm feeling a bit sick. She was devoted to her parents, who were both unwell, and she phoned them almost every other day. Yeah, bye. Linda and her husband both had that Friday off, but Linda had early morning sickness and stayed in bed. It's precisely 8 o'clock on Friday the 21st of August. Her husband gave breakfast to his son and a friend who'd stayed the night. There's your breakfast. Shame you lost in the match last night, eh? Yeah. The funeral of Rudolf Hess has been delayed while his relatives consider requesting a second autopsy. At 8.20, the two boys left to catch the bus to school. At about 10, Andrew drove Linda to the chemist's. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Um, I'm six weeks pregnant and I've been suffering very badly from morning sickness. I wonder if you had anything to help me. How long is it lasting? Oh, it seems to go on all day. In that case, I don't think that there's anything that I could recommend that would help you. I suggest that you go and see your doctor. Really? I'm sorry. OK, thanks. Bye. Linda went round the corner to the health centre and asked for a prescription from her doctor. Well, actually, Dr McKendrick isn't in the health centre at the moment. I'll speak to him when he comes in and ask him, but he may want you to make an appointment. Would you call back just after 11 o'clock and I'll have seen him by then? Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Frustrated by all this, and by now feeling ill and irritable, Linda went home with Andrew. For some reason, she began to pack the bag she used for her night shifts, though she wasn't due at work until the following afternoon. Maybe she was going to her parents. I'm going out. You can pick up the car from work tomorrow at three. Well, I did need the car, Linda. But if you're going to Dundee, you could give me a lift. If you're ready now, then come. If not, you can get the bus. Come on, Chip. Well, just give us a minute and I'll go get my files. Neither Linda nor Shep have been seen since. Linda often did stay with her parents, and they lived in Glenrothes, but they weren't expecting her. At any rate, Linda's car, with or without her at the wheel, almost certainly took one of these routes south. It was discovered next day in central Manchester. Dale Street behind Piccadilly Station. Just after 9am on Saturday the 22nd, a traffic warden gave Linda's Cavalier a parking ticket. Next day at 6.15 on Sunday evening, a policeman noticed the car had been broken into and the radio cassette was missing. 741 to CK Alpha 1. A vehicle check please on Delta 266 Charlie Echo Sierra. Um, check on Delta 266, Charlie Echo Sierra, shows to a Vauxhall Cavalier in white. Registered to Olympic Cairns. Could be using the name Hunter. 
When police examined the car, they found suggestions that Linda had not been the last driver. The driver's seat had been adjusted for someone much taller than Linda. Linda's bags had been left in the back, along with tablets for Shep, who had a heart and bladder condition. But her money, about 30 pounds and three credit cards, were gone. One of her earrings was found lying in the boot. The grey covers that had been on all the seats had been removed from the front. And the floor mat on the passenger side was missing. Both the tools and the spare wheel seemed to have disappeared. In fact, the wheel had been fitted to the front off side. So where were the tools and the other wheel and tyre? It was a distinctive Antibes Cavalier. Somewhere between Carnoustie and Manchester, between Friday and Saturday mornings, that wheel had been changed. But where and by whom? As Lilani, it seems logical that whoever took off the seat covers and took the mat away from the floor was doing so to make sure there were no forensic clues left behind. This is certainly a very strong possibility. I know that technically you are not investigating a crime, but you must be fairly pessimistic about the chances of finding Linda. We're very concerned for Linda's safety, and uh, I would certainly appeal to Linda, if she should be watching this programme, to please contact us. You think there is a faint possibility she might still be alive? A remote possibility, I think. Now, her dog, of course, is also missing. Live or dead, may have been found. He's, he's quite an old dog, 14 years or so. Yes, the dog's 14 years old. It's a cross collie. Uh, it has several distinctive features. All four feet are white. The dog has been neutered, and there is a small operation scar on the right haunch. Now, it also had a heart and bladder condition, didn't it? Uh, yes. Hence the pills. Maybe a vet has uh, got some information about that. But it's only that very distinctive dog with that scar on the right back leg that we're interested in. Also, of course, there might be witnesses to the drive down because that car, uh, D266 CES, had a puncture by the looks of it. Yes, uh, we would be very interested in anybody who may have seen the car between uh, Carnoustie and Manchester uh, on the 21st, 22nd of August of this year. It's quite a distinctive car. Incidentally, if anybody's found that tyre, the tyre itself, I know it's an MXL radial, anybody in the tyre business would know that's very rare, and it's obviously very rare to find one attached to a wheel somewhere. It's unusual, and it's unusual insofar as uh, Vauxhall fitted it to that particular model, the Antibes, which uh, there was only 2,625, I believe, produced. Uh, I think it would be most unusual to find that wheel and tyre lying by the roadside. Well, the best hope, perhaps, is that someone has found some of that material discarded from the car. Whatever information you have, do call us if you can help in any way. 01811 That's 01811 You can speak to a BBC researcher or to a detective, all in the strictest confidence. If you prefer, you can call the incident room at Dundee. That's 0382 232 We have to. We have to. We're always reluctant to show violent crimes committed by intruders in people's homes. For one thing, they're intensely disturbing. For another, they're extremely rare. In fact, our next case is so unusual, it's bizarre. This is Cowden Beath in Fife. We uh, had seen the place advertised and uh, put in a bid and successfully uh, got the house. We didn't move in until about September, early September. We planned for about six months before the move-in date, all the things we would do to it, and it was like our dream home. The clock had been given as a Christmas gift one year after we'd been married from our daughter Linda and our son-in-law Jim. So it was a prized possession that it stood in pride of place on the mantelpiece below June's portrait. Just round the corner from the Mathis home is an industrial estate. Oh well, we've been doing some tarmacking down the road and uh, we got some left over 
And uh, we noticed you got some potholes here that need filling. And we'd, we'd wondering, would you like us to do it for you? So the money you for that? Fifteen quid. Right, okay. The full squad struck me definitely as uh, us travelling people, more from the gypsy side. Had uh, an English accent, and it said he'd been working down in the Manchester area. Right, that's about the size of it then. That's one thousand six hundred and fifty pounds, please. The boy told me it was going to be fifteen pounds. Yeah, fifteen quid a square metre. Oh, I can't afford that. Hey, 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 hang on, you can afford it. You've got a thriving business here. So if you want your business to thrive some more, you'll pay up, okay? What do you mean by that? Listen, I'll tell you what I mean by that. I'm getting my bloody money's worth out of this place one way or another. So you better pay up, mate, okay? At that point, I took that to mean that he was going to smash the place up over me. So we paid the money and away we went. Just more or less to get them off the yard. One week later, on a Friday afternoon, June Mathis was finishing work at her pub about five minutes from her house. Nice me getting off now, Linda. I'll see, see you later. tonight. See you later. Cheerio. She would have been at her home when this man was driving down her street. From the Perth Road, I pulled into Lucas Beef Drive at about uh, 4.45, heading up towards my house. And I noticed the white van parked on the corner of Glenfield Drive. It was half on, half off the path, which was a bit weird. Guy Mathis works in the oil industry and was looking forward to the weekend off. When I left work that evening, a lot of work had been done to the house, so um, the tiler had been in to finish tiling the kitchen, which was one of the very last things that was being done to the house. So it had just about reached the uh, completion stage, and I was thinking, God, when I get home, I'll have a look at the tiles, and that'll be virtually us finished and completed our dream home. It was about quarter past six in the Friday evening. I was driving down Glenfield Road. When I turned the corner, I saw someone standing on the pavement. When I glanced, I saw it was a, a man standing, uh, standing still for no apparent reason. I thought it was strange. It was dark and there wasn't any bus stop nearby. Hello, June. Mom. Safe. Where's your safe? There's no safe. He kept on about two safes, and I says, there's definitely no safes in the house. Well, I know June and Guy Mathis quite well after doing work in the house, and I just so happened that I was passing when I seen a red escort, which had been reversed into the driveway. It was a Jai or a key race. Don't know any part of the family that's got a car like that. Don't look. Don't look. June and Guy's ordeal was to last an hour, and we only hint at the violence that was used. But June kept her head and made a oh. mental note of details, oh. like the breach of one of the three guns. Nice down. Come on up. It had sort of a brass yeah. fancy bit on the top. Around seven o'clock, at the corner, I noticed a white transit in June's drive. I thought this was a bit funny because it's not the sort of van you would see in June's drive. It's about had enough of you two. Right, get back. See you in a bit. Yes, hello? Is that the police? What was stolen was chiefly of sentimental value. Some jewellery, for instance, which had belonged to June's sister, who died the year before. We had her jewellery, and her jewellery was to go to the grandchildren. You know, I could always look at it and say, well, this was Jean. Mm. So it's things that... Uh, That's all you had to remember her by. Mm. People that comes into homes with guns should be stopped. I don't know, it just shouldn't be. One of the thoughts that crossed my mind during the thing was, what if our daughter or son came with the grandchildren while all this was happening? What would have happened then to those people? Would they have been snatched, the grandchildren? 
and that's a frightening thought. Ian Beattie, obviously the first thing you've got to do is eliminate these three tarmacers who were there the week before. Yes, that's correct. What can you tell us about them? We have a description yes. of the three men. The first man, he was 20 years of age, 5 foot 8 tall, fair hair and he was heavy build. The second man was mid to late 30s, 6 foot tall, black hair, stout build and he had a short moustache and beard. The third man was mid 30s, 5 foot 10 inches tall, blonde hair and was medium build. Okay, they all had uh, North of England accents, I gather, and of course they may or may not be connected with the robbery. You need to find out who they were. They did have a Ford Transit van, a white Ford Transit. We know that a white Ford Transit and a, a red Ford Escort were involved in, in the robbery. There was no safe at that house, though, ever, was there? No, there's never ever been a safe Completely in that house. Tough information. What they took was of tremendous sentimental value. Uh, this is a, a reproduction of the Ormolu clock that was stolen. Tell us about the watches. Is there anything distinctive yes. about them? Raymond Veal watches, a ladies and gents watch, and these are exact replicas of the watches that were stolen from the house. Well, if anybody uh, offers you watches like those, or this sort of reproduction, or milieu clock, please call the police. If you know anything about this or recognise any of those three men, the number here in the studio is 0818118181. 0818118181. Or you can contact the Fife Incident Room direct. The number there is 0592526. Ever since, there's been a huge inquiry. For next Monday, these cases will be a central feature of the recalled conference at Scotland Yard, which is coordinating information on 17 cases, separate cases, of children being abducted and killed. Now, shortly, we'll be going live to join Deputy Chief Constable Hector Clark, who's at the incident room in Edinburgh. But first, here in the Crime Watch studio in London, is Detective Chief Inspector Stuart Henderson. Mr Henderson, remind us first of the Susan Maxwell case. Well, you've got a lot of publicity, of course, yes. at the time. Susan was a lovely, dark-haired 11-year-old who lived with her family at Cornhill on Tweed in Northumbria, which is two miles south of Coldstream in the border area of the country. Friday, the 30th of July, 1982, was a lovely afternoon strong sunshine, and Susan decided to play tennis in Coldstream. Now we have a film of the events of that afternoon. The afternoon of Friday the 30th of July was warm and sunny, and Susan had arranged to play tennis with a friend in Coldstream. They finished their game at about four o'clock, and Susan had two and a half miles to walk home to Cornhill. Her route took her down the main road, the A697, and then right across the bridge over the River Tweed, which forms the border between Scotland and England. Susan was last seen on this stretch of road, just beyond the bridge, at about ten past four. She was wearing bright yellow shorts and shirt and carrying a tennis racket. Only five minutes after that sighting, further down the same stretch of road, another witness recalled seeing a maroon car driving quite slowly towards Cornhill. A two-door Morris Marina coupe. But now, there was no sign of Susan. Back near the Tweed Bridge, about 35 minutes later, was another car that hasn't been traced. A maroon Triumph 2000. Now, for four years, you've been trying to find that Triumph 2000 without avail. The other car, the Marina, the, this is a new appeal. This is a new appeal. The Marina was seen where Susan went missing from, around the time she disappeared. And this vehicle was driving unusually slowly. And we're very, very keen to trace that vehicle. The driver may be, in fact, a witness. We're desperate to trace that vehicle, or anyone who would know of the driver of that vehicle at that time in that area. Now, poor Susan was discovered, eventually, in the English Midlands. Tragically, she was found in Staffordshire, in a copse, adjacent to the A518, which runs between Utoxeter and Stafford. That was on the... 12th of August. Now that's the A518 near a place called Loxley. Near Loxley, yes. The various clues, if only we could find them, uh, yes. one of which is her tennis racket. She'd gone, as you said, to play tennis. Yes. The racket has never been discovered. Yes. This is a Dunlop Alpha of early 1962 manufacture. Not easily come by nowadays, and obviously we're desperately trying to find its whereabouts now. Now this is so rare that Dunlop have had to very kindly make a special replica up for us. Do you really want everyone who's got one of these Dunlop Alpha rackets to ring in? You've got lots of calls. We're desperately trying to find the racket and anyone who may have found it may in fact be playing with it now. 
So if anyone has it, please contact us. If anyone knows where a similar item is, please get in touch with us. We'll give you the numbers shortly. The flask, this is a replica of the one Identical replica carrying. flask, and the same applies. We're still trying to find out which was, in fact, in possession of Susan. Right. Um, we have a letter here from Crime Watch, uh, at Crime Watch, from someone who's written to us from Holiday in Skegness, saying that they did indeed find a tennis racket with some clothes some years back. Is it important, they ask? It is. If you wrote this letter to us, please, please, do contact us tonight. Let's move, if we may now, yes. to the case of Caroline Hogg, another case, of course, which got a great deal of <coughs> publicity. Remind us of Caroline. Caroline was a fair-haired five-year-old child who resided in Portobello on the outskirts of Edinburgh, the family. And again, on Friday the 8th of July, 1983, another lovely day, Caroline left her home about 7, 5 p.m. to play in the immediate area of her home. Now, this Portobello area, uh, on, a, on a Friday evening, a warm Friday evening, a lot of people were there. Probably. Many people we haven't traced and we're still very keen to find them. We have two particular sightings of men seen with girls who may or may not be Caroline. We're still desperately trying to find these men. Take us through them. First, there's one I know that you've had uh, publicity for before. Yes, we have done exceptional inquiry into this particular case. This man, the artist's impression you see here, has not been traced. We're still desperately trying to find him. If anyone can tell us of this man, we're very interested. And a relatively new inquiry. Yes, there is a sighting in Bath Street, uh, again, of a man with a child. It may be a father and daughter. This we don't know. We're desperately trying to find this gentleman or anyone who may know him. If anyone can describe this man to us or can, in fact, identify him, the main factor being thick lens spectacles, obviously indicating poor eyesight. OK, now that is a new inquiry, or at least a new appeal. A car that was seen, too, near Coldstream. Yes, about 9.15, 9.30, that same evening, the 8th of July, a witness was in a near collision with a light-coloured motor car now, travelling south towards Coldstream. This car, obviously you need to trace, uh, a driver driving that badly, you might think, is unlikely to, to call in. This gentleman has been given proof from the Lord Advocate of immunity to any possible contravention of anything, in which case we would desperately like to find him. We would like the gentleman to come forward if, in fact, he's watching the programme. We would like anyone who has any knowledge of the person driving that vehicle on that night at that time to get in touch with us. 8th of July 1983, the critical dates. Paul Caroline was found again in the English Midlands. Some 300 miles from the abduction point, Caroline was found in a lay-by adjacent to the A-4 in Leicestershire on the junction uh, or the junction road between Twycross and Twycross Zoo. Now, she hadn't lain there all the time since the date of her abduction. So for there's a, two or three days, she might have been seen with somebody. She might have been... The suggestions from our inquiries would indicate that she may have been other than there between, say, the 9th and 10th of July. Right. So if anyone has any knowledge of that or sightings, we're obviously interested. Her clothes have never been recovered. These are replicas. Just quickly explain them to us, can you? This is the party dress of a five-year-old child, as you see here. She was wearing that evening when abducted. We have not recovered it. It may be lying in a field. Someone may have seen it and left it. It may be, in fact, in someone's house. The right. person that took it may, in fact, still have it. We're desperately trying to find it. And the shoes similarly? The shoes apply in the light case. We have not recovered them. We're still looking for them. If anyone has any knowledge, we wish to trace them. Thank you very much indeed. Well, let's now go live to Edinburgh, to the instant room, and to the man who's in overall charge of this inquiry. He's the Deputy Chief Constable Hector Clark. Uh, Mr. Clark, good evening to you. Good evening. Uh, firstly, tell us what special appeal you're now trying to make tonight. Well, for, for four years now, we've carried out an intensive inquiry, and we have to admit that we're no nearer to finding out who killed or who, who abducted these two children. Really, what we do now seek is information from members of the public. Mr. Henderson has already given you some indication of that, but I would like any member of the public who has a suspicion about any person to let us know at once whether or not they have access to one of the cars that your program has featured or whether or not they fit the artist's impression that were also shown in the program. Now you revealed quite a lot of new information tonight on these two cases. How convinced are you that these two cases are likely to be linked? Well we've always said that there were similarities but there are also differences. I suppose there's a fair chance that they are linked but for investigative processes, we've treated them jointly yet separately. We've never, uh, we've always made sure that we've managed to retain our separate identity in each case. 
Now, I know, Mr. Clark, that somebody has written to you directly at Edinburgh, someone you're desperate to get in contact with again. Yes, we've, we've had two letters, uh, one in 83 and one in 84, from uh, a lady, obviously the same writer, who was uh, writing in the first instance from Dundee. In the second instance, she said she had moved to uh, North Angus, which is in the area just north of Dundee. Uh, she indicated that on the afternoon that, Sir, that Caroline Hogg went missing, she met a man in Dundee. That man was going later that day to Edinburgh and thence to the Midlands. We're desperately anxious to trace Alice or the, let the writer of these letters. And uh, also, we would like to hear from anyone who thinks they can tell us who Alice is. Mr. Clark, thank you very much indeed. The number direct to the incident room there in Edinburgh and to Mr. Clark, 031 311 3505. Remember, it's in confidence. 031, if you're outside Edinburgh, 311 3505. ...is of an armed raid on a bank near Edinburgh Airport, a robbery that must have been meticulously planned. And that's where maybe you can help. As you'll see, despite a silent alarm which secretly alerted the police, the gunman managed to escape, and in a most unconventional way. They may well have driven over their escape route in advance. It took them through places where cars are rarely, if ever, seen. So if you saw them, you'd certainly remember. Our reconstruction begins on the day the robbery took place, two months ago. It's the afternoon of Monday, July the 10th. From its heart at the Castle Hill, Edinburgh stretches out through countryside to join with dozens of what were once small villages. This is Newbridge, bordering the airport on the city's western fringe. It's 20 past three, and the Royal Bank is about to close its doors. Hello, assistant manager, can I help you? Empties are to all vehicles stand by. That's a raid alarm in operation at the Royal Bank of Scotland. Oh, folks, we're one six en route to Newbridge Bank. Right, kids, find them. I haven't got them. Well, find them now. <laughs> By now, five minutes had elapsed. The police were taking up positions in a cordon round the area, while other vehicles sped on towards the bank. Come on, move! A passing motorist saw the robbers running to their car. He watched in his rearview mirror as the gunman fell in behind him. Then they turned right towards Ratho Station. He decided to reverse and follow them. The robbers turned left into the grounds of the Norton House Hotel. The exit from the hotel is the A8, often clogged with traffic. Quite sure that the getaway car would be caught up in it, the witness abandoned the chase to let the police know where the robbers would be found. On the police! What? The speeding car attracted the attention of people in the grounds. All vehicles attending at the Royal Bank of Scotland, Newbridge, the Silver Astra has been seen entering the grounds of the Norton House Hotel. But still in the grounds of the hotel, the men abandoned the vehicle. Leonard Cuthbert walks his dog here every day, but rarely sees a car. 
In fact, it's so unusual, he was suspicious and told the police. From here, the robbers continued along farm lanes and across fields, turning left onto the Freelands Road. A panda car searching the area was looking for robbers in a silver Astra. Empty as I to all vehicles attending the call from Bank of Scotland. It's a lookout request for a red Astra, Echo 102, Bravo Delta Sierra. Hello Control, from Charlie 2, reference the bank raid at Newbridge. We're now in pursuit of red Vauxhall Astra motor vehicle, Echo 102, Bravo Delta Sierra. The vehicle is travelling east in Freelands Road towards Ingolston. From Charlie 2, over. Roger, Charlie 2. The Red Astra was last seen leaving Norton House heading towards Ingolston. But that was the last the police saw of the robbers. What is now known is that they continued along minor roads to Roddinglaw, where again they took to farm lanes and the fields. Approaching the busy A720, they avoided traffic by driving underneath it through a pedestrian subway. Still using lanes and back roads, they drove onto the Sight Hill Industrial Estate. Later that afternoon, police found the car abandoned outside the Ethicon building on Bankside Avenue. Well, Mr Crookston, it was an elaborate getaway. It must have been planned in advance. It was well planned in advance, yes. It's an area where uh, courting couples go and where people regularly walk. Um, and I would ask anyone who was on these tracks that day uh, to get in touch with us. In fact, though, if it was planned in advance, we're not only talking about uh, July the 10th, the day of the crime, but uh, any, any time in weeks leading up to that. Days and even weeks before 10th of July, yes. Right. Perhaps the most public place, apart from the bank itself that day, where people, many people may have seen them, is at the Ethicon building, where they abandoned the Red Astra. That's right. The police recovered the Astra fairly quickly after the raid. Uh, it is an area which, as you've said, is very, very busy, and uh, people must have seen the men leave the car there. I would ask anyone who did see these people leave the car to contact us as soon as possible. Now, both cars were stolen from Glasgow, both on the same day, which was the 7th of July. Where exactly were they stolen from? That's right. The silver car was stolen from Anderston Quay in Glasgow and the red car from Hill Street. We are anxious to trace their movements, obviously, between the 7th and 10th July over that weekend. And again, if anyone saw them, uh, we would like to know about it. One thing, they didn't change the number plates of either of the cars. So if I could just tell you what the number plates are again. The Silver Astra's registration number is B37BYS and the Red Astra's registration number is E102BDS. So the cars are now back with their rightful owners. We're not interested in sighting since the 10th of July, but we do not want to know, we do want to know where those were between the 7th and the 10th. Yes, indeed. Do you have any descriptions of the men? Yes, we do. Uh, as one of the, the raiders was leaving the silver-coloured car to go into the bank, he pulled on a mask. He is described to us as being between 30 and 35 years of age, 5 foot 7 to 5 foot 8 in height. He has collar-length dark brown hair, a dark moustache, and the witnesses describe him as wearing Buddy Holly-type glasses, dark-rimmed glasses. And that particular man, I gather, was heard to call another man by name. The name Bobby was used during the raid in the bank. So it could be genuine or could have been a blind, you never know. We just don't know. And there's a reward, I gather? Yes, the banks have agreed uh, to pay up to £10,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the people responsible for this robbery. All right, well, Mr Crook Crookson, thank you very much indeed. Here's the number if you can help. It's 01 8055 here to the studio, or you can call the incident room in Edinburgh direct, and that is on 031 311 3211. David Hatcher. First on incident desk, that request from police north of the border. On November the 11th last year, a body was washed ashore on the Isle of Tyree, a few miles off the west coast of Scotland and 70 miles to the north of Ireland. For the past 10 weeks, forensic scientists have been trying to identify it and have now been able to establish three basic facts. It was a woman aged about 60, she was 5 foot 4 inches tall and her body had been in the water for about 6 months. And there are other clues to her identity. These red patterned socks belong to the woman and she was wearing black boots with elasticated sides. We need to know if anybody recognises them or knows where they were made. Most importantly, if you have any idea who the woman might be, please call us. Ferocious robbery, a ram-raiding attack, which 
in which two shop workers were almost killed. It happened two months ago at the Jewel on the outskirts of Edinburgh. It was 8.30 on the morning of Thursday, October the 9th. We've used actors throughout this reconstruction, and the security routine we show has since been substantially changed. I was looking forward to work that day. I was going to be very busy. No two days are ever the same, and it's a challenge every day. 8.16 a.m., and the car park's almost empty. But whose is this? A red Vauxhall Omega, a rare high-powered saloon. Hello? Yep. Yeah, okay then. Right. Right. Listen, I'm going to have to go. Mm. Okay. See ya. As I was waiting for my statement to print out from the cash point, I just turned round and I'd heard a car coming into the car park. I found it quite strange because obviously the shop wasn't open. So here was another red car, one of several that morning. This one, a maroon cavalier that had been stolen two days earlier. It now had false plates copied from a legitimate Vauxhall cavalier that's unconnected with what happened next. Back in the car park, a sign writer was changing opening times in preparation for the start of 24-hour shopping. As I was driving out, a second car had drove in. It was a small car and it had three people in, and it drove up beside the first car. I thought it was quite strange because no one was getting out of the cars. They did look quite relaxed. I thought maybe they were dropping someone off at work. I felt that we'd both had a close escape from death or serious injury. The men I saw running into the shop maybe weren't even in the car in the first place. They may have been stood outside and run in. They were all really calm. I thought he was actually going to blow my head off. I actually thought at that stage, you know, why are, why are you going to shoot me, you know? I've done everything you've sort of asked. Why shoot me? Quick, get help! There's robbers and they've got guns! Security! Security! To the foyer, right away! The two robbers, with their driver, made off in the Cavalier. Calmly, they turned right out of the Asda car park towards the A1 roundabout. But there, the driver seemed to lose his cool. From here, they briefly disappeared. Where did they go? They had no right to do that to us as ordinary shop workers just trying to make a decent living. I still feel very angry. In the next 10 minutes, the Cavalier must have stopped to let out two members of the gang. A witness at New Craig Hall saw only one man in the vehicle. I remember looking at the car, I didn't recognise it. I didn't recognise the chap that was inside it either. He was early to mid-30s. He had sort of olive, darkish complexion. Um, he was quite slim, he had quite a lined, gaunt face. He had short, dark hair with a, a receding hairline. I thought he had either a mole or a spot or something on his cheek. I remember thinking it was a nice car. 
and wondered what the chap did. It's quite a small village and we all know each other and you pretty much know people's cars and who they are and people's faces. He pulled in just next to the, the, the skips, um, about so 20 yards from my car, um, and just parked, and I looked across him again. There was another car parked directly across from my car. It was a red car that wasn't normally there. This could have been the Peugeot 106 seen earlier at Asda. Did you notice it that morning? The driver of the Cavalier seemed to amble away. But did he then double back into Klondike Street and drive off in the red Peugeot? Harry McCadden once inclined to use terms like professional meticulous with this crime, but actually it was bloody reckless as well, wasn't it? Yeah, that's absolutely right. These men showed a total disregard for the members of staff safety. As the, the lady passed the, the glass windows, as, as her heel was actually at the windows, the car crashed through. There was a, a space of time of one second. Now, was that careful planning good timing on their part, or was that just luck? It was absolute luck. They just luck they weren't Totally killed. didn't care about their safety. Now, because of the violence, the extreme violence that was used in this, is a very, very big reward being put up. Tell us about the reward and how people can claim that. As the superstores and other major stores throughout the country have put up a £30,000 reward, which is a very large reward, they're very keen to have these men arrested because of the violence that was used with this particular incident. And how do you get the reward? Do you have to help the rest or convict the whole gang? Any information that's given that culminates in the arrest and conviction of one or any one of these members even of the just gang. One of them. Yes, even just one. Are, are they local men or are they Edinburgh men? No, the stolen car, the plates on the stolen car were definitely made in a shop in Newcastle, Newcastle and Tyne. And the stolen car had travelled in excess of 300 miles, so we know that it could have travelled from Edinburgh to Newcastle and back again to Edinburgh. So maybe a Tyneside connection. We've got two good descriptions. One we saw in the film, we'll come back to that in a moment. The day before the robbery, which would have been the 8th of October, somebody else was seen. And explain this, will you? Yes, we've looked at hundreds of hours of security video, and this particular gentleman is seen at the doors that the car crashed through. He seems to have a piece of paper in his hand, and he looks as if he may be sketching something. He may well be totally innocent, but we'd like to know who he is to eliminate him from the inquiry. OK, if you know that, it's call us. And, and then the driver himself. Very good witness, very good description. Yes, uh, I would like people to cast their minds back to the 9th of October. This man's described as having a distinctive mark or a scar on his left side of his face. Um, it may be an injury, so therefore he may not have it now. So I'd like to hear from anyone who knows of somebody who has a mark, a scar or a birthmark on that side of his face. It may have cleared up by now, though. Or if you know him, you could make £30,000 in a single phone call. As you saw, two people missed death, perhaps by inches, when that car came through and broke down the doors. If you know who was involved, if you recognised anything, if you've heard anything, please call us. It's live, the numbers are free, 0500 600 600. Uh, that's here to the studio, or you can call the incident room, 0131 311 The programme. The island of Orkney is more isolated than almost anywhere in Britain. 45 minutes by ferry from John O'Groats off the northern tip of Scotland. It's not the sort of place you'd expect to see a major crime. And when one happened there this summer, it was a crime that would have been extraordinary anywhere. Would you like to sit down? No, what would you like to drink tonight? Okay, I think I remember who's got what. One chicken tikka. One lamb tikka. I ordered that. Very good. And uh, who's the chicken chat? Oh, that's mine, thanks. Never left. They would keep away. You bloody shit us too. When the gunman came in, it looked like a fancy dress. When the gun went off and I realised it, it wasn't, it was a horrible thought to have your children there and not be able to do anything about it. Shamal Mahmood was 26 and from a large and successful family. This was his second time working at the restaurant in Kirkwall, having seen the job advertised in London. We had a murder in the Mumutas Indian restaurant. I want you to preserve the scene, Bob, make sure nothing's disturbed. I'll get an inquiry team together and get to you as soon as possible. The Northern Constabulary covers a vast area. Orkney hadn't had a murder for 25 years and it was necessary to provide support from the mainland. 
a helicopter wasn't available to me, making it necessary to travel by road 150 miles from Inverness to John O'Groats. We then had to travel by ferry across the Pentland Firth. That's the nature of policing in the Highlands and Islands. So how is the Holmes computer link to the mainland going? It's almost ready, sir. And what do we know about Mr Mahmoud Angus? We know that he's been on the island for about six weeks. He was here last year for about nine months, and what? at that time he was also working in the Mumataz restaurant. Anything more you would like? Uh, not meantime, time. No, no, not just uh, now. He has no enemies that we can find, uh, and we do know he has got a brother who lives in London. Uh, he was a, a very brilliant student. The family wanted him to carry on with his studies. Uh, we cannot think why it should have happened to him. He was a very kind-hearted person. The sad thing is that he got killed at a time when he was about to go home and get married to his girlfriend. We require teams to carry out inquiries at our airport and ferry terminals, to conduct house-to-house -house investigations in Kirkwall, and to re-interview all of our main witnesses. Right, Marion, what I want you to do for me is just if you could go over the events that happened in the restaurant, just in your own words. I was showing two customers to the table, and I was just about to go back for the, up to the bar for the main use when the door opened behind me, and I turned round to see who it was. And a man with a mask on came in. At first I thought it was a choke, but then I saw the gun in his hand as he went past me. He went up to the table where Shemmel was serving the customers, and I heard a shot, and I thought he was in to shoot everyone. And he, I heard the door open behind me, and he came out and went down the other lane. And the last I saw him was going down the narrow lane at the back of the restaurant. We were driving down Junction Road at about quarter past seven, and as we turned into the car park, I saw a guy out of the window on my left. He had on dark clothes and had mossy brown hair. As you're aware, the man that went into the restaurant was wearing a hooded sweat top and he had a distinctive stoop. Down here at Junction Road Toilets, which is just down behind the restaurant, at about ten past seven, we have a sighting of a man hanging about outside the toilets shortly before the murder. Well, I was driving along Junction Road, heading towards the pier, and I was about to turn into the Albert Street car park when I noticed this chap just outside the door of the toilets on my left. He was wearing a hooded top and I noticed he was wearing a balaclava underneath that. Also, there was someone who saw a man walking from the direction of the toilets, across the road, in the direction of the restaurant. George, the people of Orkney are very concerned about this murder. How can they help you with your inquiries? I'm keen for anyone who was in Kirkwall on the day of the murder and who may have seen anything suspicious to come forward. Can you tell me what time of day that was at? Uh, it was about ten past five, and uh, I was about to go down the lane past the Mamma Cash restaurant when this guy got down in front of me and he turned to stare at me, which I thought was quite frightening at the time. The way he held his arms was uh, like a bodybuilder. He was in his 20s, about 28, I would say, and his height would have been about 5 feet 8 to 6 feet. This sighting is of particular interest because of the similar physical characteristics to the person seen in and around the restaurant, but at the end of the day, we still haven't established a motive for this crime. I'm always looking for an exit. Daddy, I can't sleep. It's okay. Daddy will take you through and tuck you in. The effect it's had on our family since the incident is one of distrust. Uh, we have had difficulty going out in the evenings. Things are getting better now, and we hope the kids are getting back to normal. It's difficult to take in such a horrendous event. In the four months since this happened, you've obviously made extensive inquiries in the Orkneys. Now, how can a national appeal help? Well, we hope to reach the people of Orkney with a visual reconstruction through Crime Watch, uh, which may help to jog their memories. Also, of course, the programme will reach the remainder of Britain, where we hope to uh, contact anyone who has been on holiday in Orkney. Orkney and Kirtwell in particular has a very uh, industrious holiday trade in the summer. Now, I know you haven't got a motive, but there was a possibility of motive in as much as the day before the murder there was a sighting of 
an argument going on at the restaurant, the door of the restaurant. Yeah, that's correct. About half past eight the, uh, the night before the murder, uh, witnesses described to us that two people were arguing with the now deceased Shamul Mahmood outside the restaurant in the doorway of the restaurant. Now that may have an innocent explanation, but our inquiry has failed to trace these people. Now, that was Wednesday the 1st of June. If we roll back two weeks, there was a, another site, and this time rather more remarkable, in, in Woods, which are part of the town. Describe what happened there. Well, it's an area known as uh, Parkdale Woods, which is uh, within the town of uh, Kirkwall. Uh, our witnesses described to us that a man was carrying out uh, what appeared to be commando manoeuvres within the woods for no obvious uh, good reason. Again, that might uh, be an innocent uh, pastime, but we would like to hear from the person to have it explained. Obviously, then, we also need to find uh, any other witnesses to, to the man outside the, the public lavatories. And we should explain that while we were filming, it was raining. Actually, the day of the murder, the 2nd of June, it was one of the hottest evenings of the year. Yeah. So his uh, dress would have been most extraordinary, having a collar up, let alone a balaclava. Well, that's correct. The weather was so good that there's no good reason for having a hood up. And the bodybuilder in the alleyway, now there's really nothing much to connect him with the crime. You really want to eliminate this man. Again, as we've seen from the reconstruction, this man is of great interest to us, and unfortunately our inquiries to date have failed to trace him, and he hasn't come forward. If he recognises himself from the programme and is prepared to come forward with an explanation, that will be very helpful. OK. Well, if you live in Kirkwall or if you uh, were in Orkney at the time, please call if there's any way in which you can help. The number is 0500 600 600. That's a free call number in the studio, 0500 600 600. Or you can ring the Orkney Incident Room. That's on 0856 872 076. Worthy of Agatha Christie, except uh, in this case, it's horribly real. Why should a man, by all accounts uh, a nice guy who still lives at home with his mum, change his regular routine, indeed change his lifestyle for three days? And why at the end of that long weekend should somebody kill him? Just outside Edinburgh, South Queensferry sits between the two famous bridges that span the Firth of Forth. Robert Higgins was known to everyone. He lived nearby in the village of Dalmini. Was work all right then, son? Aye, fine. That's me till next week. Are you going to go across to fight to see your brother then? No, I can't. I've not got any money. Oh, that's me. I'll have to go. Do you want anything for the shops? No, I'm all right. OK, then. Cheerio. See you later. There's five children in the family, and Robert was the third one. He started playing football when he was 12, and he carried on till he was 16, 17, and that he could have really went somewhere, I think, in the end, because he had good motivation with the ball. Robert was a very quiet person. He would never um, harm anybody. Robert worked at a poultry farm at Newbridge, and um, it was very physical work. It was quite a demanding job and shifts and things like that. So, and that's what he did Monday till Thursday. He was very quiet through the week. He never went out, but at the weekend he did go out and have a drink and sometimes too much. Uh, what can I go for me? Okay. 18. Okay. Uh, lager. Lager. Put some music on. Cheers. Oh, we're going to have to cut less than the night. Why, where do you want to go? The Catlins. Aye. I haven't been for a while. What time's the next bus? We'll get a bus. We'll get a taxi. Oh, come on, Higgy. It's just two minutes up the road. We'll get a bus. You not get me on the bus. Look, I've got the money. We'll get a taxi. You're daft. Aye, fair enough. Hey, Bob. Good night, Bob. Higgy had come in with some friends about half past eight, and my friends left about half past eleven. So he just sat himself and finished off his drink. Okay. I'll just finish this wee bit off, aye. He left about 12 o'clock, went down the stairs as usual. Right, get Right. Just put the jacket on. Cheers. When in Kirkliston, Robert would often doss down with a friend or get a taxi home. Tonight, the friend was busy, and at first Robert couldn't get a taxi. He was still in Main Street, Kirkliston, at 2 a.m. He didn't go home on the Thursday night. He obviously had somewhere that he was going to, and I found it quite unusual that he didn't phone my mum, which he would normally do. 
He'd always phone my mum to say he was stopping out. But by 11.30 on Friday morning, alone at a local hotel, Robert was seen again. Why was he here? And where did he spend Friday lunchtime until the early evening? It was about quarter to eight, and I was on my way to the shop, and I saw Higgy standing outside the retreat. He was speaking to a man in his late thirties to early forties, about five foot eight to five foot ten, and had dark brown hair. We found that really unusual with Robert not going into the Queen's, um, so he must have been waiting on someone outside, um, and it was a Friday night, so he hasn't still phone phoned home, and he still hasn't contacted the family in any way. Then, for the second morning running, Robert turned up alone at the Fourth Bridges. Who was he staying with nearby? And again, where did he spend the rest of the day? This is just outside the Fourth Bridges Hotel. I was going to the bingo at the Exservicemen's Club in South Queen's Ferry, and I got off the bus at the south side toll and I looked right and saw Robert walking down from the flyover. And I just had a quick glance and walked on. I don't know where he went, but it's a possibility that he was going down into South Queen's Ferry itself. That was another strange thing Robert did. He's been seen, but um, not in any of his locals. I mean, so where has he been? I mean, he must have been with somebody that he's known. And he hasn't even bothered contacting the family on the Saturday again. It was Sunday. I'd been to Queen's Ferry Parish Church and I left there about 11.20. I went into Morrison Gardens and I saw Robert coming along the road. I knew Robert from school but the people he was with, I didn't know. I thought that they were looking quite worse for wear. Were you among this group? Or do you know who they were? Robert wouldn't sleep rough. He wasn't the type of person who would just go to a park bench, sit down, go to sleep. He was scared of the dark. And I can't imagine him sleeping out in the dark. You know, he certainly, we feel Robert stayed somewhere over that weekend. Um, we feel someone may be seen Robert coming and going that weekend. Next day, Monday the 1st of May, Robert Higgins' body was discovered at a quarry three miles from his home. He'd been stabbed. Superintendent Ducky Watson, you're convinced this is a local crime, local people have the solution to it? Yes, this has been a local inquiry and the answer almost certainly lies locally. But tonight's reconstruction gives the community in South Queen's Ferry and Kitliston uh, the first opportunity to really see the sequence of events that leads up to the Robert Higgins' death that weekend. And we hope this will jog some memories. But, but more importantly, I feel that Higgy was such a well-known character uh, in that community that I feel the information that's been coming into us has been very, very slow, simply because the public there feel that we know that information already, and that's just not the case. What we need from that community is every single piece of information they have about Robert Higgins and his movements that weekend, especially where he spent the missing nights that weekend. Somebody out there in that community knows exactly where Robert Higgins stayed on these missing nights, and my appeal is simple. Let us have that information. 0500 600 600. 0500 600 600 is our free call here. Now, that couple in Morrison Gardens, you've got quite good descriptions of them now since we did that reconstruction, particularly the woman. Yes, the female, she's slightly different from the person portrayed in the reconstruction. She's slim to medium build and around 5 foot 5, but she's white, 45 to 55, black curly perm, collar length hair, wearing a blue long style jacket and light coloured trousers. The jacket itself is light coloured as well. Uh, the male, he's 35, 30 to 45, sorry, 5 foot 8, 5 foot 9, short brown hair, clean shaven, uh, casually dressed with a casual shirt, but also wearing a suit style jacket. Now, back on the Friday night, that's what, the 28th of April, just after he was seen outside the Queen's Retreat, that was about 7.45, he was seen another man, we saw that in the reconstruction, yeah. he was seen again with a couple. Yeah, around 9 o'clock uh, that night, uh, Robert was seen in Rosebury Avenue uh, with a couple. Own females described, and she's described as being white, in her 40s, heavy build, uh, 
fair hair, cut short at the back, but longer in the top, uh, wearing a black dress style jacket and clutching the uh, shoulder strap for a, for a black shiny shoulder bag. And again, you feel that she's got to be a local person. Robert's family obviously distraught about this. They managed to, to get together a reward. Tell us about that. Yes, by various activities in the local community, Robert, uh, Robert's family and relatives and friends have gotten together and raised uh, £2,000. That's a reward that's up uh, for anyone who gives us information which leads to the arrest of, uh, and subsequent conviction of the person or persons responsible for Robert Higgins' murder. Well, if you want to call uh, Mr Watson, call here. If you want to call the local police direct, the incident room is at Livingston. It's on 01506 445 655. That's 01506 445 655. Six months to a remote part of the country, and maybe you know somebody who's been there. On Monday, September the 24th, last year, the small village of Kalboki was shocked by a murder. The victim was Elizabeth Sutherland, a popular woman in the village and the mother of two children. Her home, Kalboki, is on the Black Isle, just north of Inverness. The Black Isle is a peninsula on the south side of the Cromarty Firth. The village of Kulboki, with a population of about 300, overlooks the Firth. This is where Elizabeth Sutherland lived. This is the family home, Dunrobin. It's on the outskirts of Kulboki, on the road towards the next village, Munlochy. Only five feet tall, Elizabeth was also known as Totsy. Her husband, Kenny, is a builder, and they have a son, Stephen. On the morning of Monday, September the 24th, Totsy dropped off her other child, Jane, at the village school. Hi, Dan. Cheerio. See you later. Watch yourself. Yeah, bye. 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 Her next stop was to pick up the morning paper. Morning, Alice. Morning, Tots. Thank you. Thank you. Cheerio. Cheerio. By 12 o'clock, after calling at her parents' house, Totsy was home and finishing off the housework. Then, about 12.30, she walked the 50 yards down to her parents' house to see her sister. See those barrels we bought. Uh huh. See if they fit in the pots. Really? Well, mine are fine. Look at this. Totsy was always active in village life. That day, she and her sister Jane were planning for the local bulb show. They're on fine with mine. Mm -hmm. I think we might win something there. Oh, I think Lovely. so. I think mm -hmm. we've a good chance at this mm -hmm. year. Definitely. Uh huh. I was thinking of planting some in the garden. You know, really? this afternoon. Uh huh. Oh, well, that'd make a nice display for the spring, wouldn't mm -hmm. it? At about the same time, a mile away, this lorry driver finished his break and set off up the Mount Eagle Road. The road goes by the Mount Eagle transmitter in the direction of Kulboki. A mile further on, he'd passed the Sutherland's house. As the lorry drove along the single track road, a red Cavalier car tried to get past. The driver remembered that the registration number ended with a T. You know what you're doing now? Uh -huh. Right. Okay, Totsy left her sister after chatting for no more than ten minutes. Meanwhile, the lorry driver noticed the red cavalier again. It was now parked, with the driver apparently gone, and less than a quarter of a mile from Dunrobin. The lorry driver saw Totsy as he passed the house. The time, according to his tachograph, was 12.38. This was the last time she was definitely seen alive. 
Strangers and strange cars stand out in a small community like Kalboki, and several incidents were noticed that day. At one o'clock, this cyclist was seen heading into Kalboki village. He had a hat and a fawn coat. The police have never been able to trace him. At 1.35, a man was seen on the Dunkerston Road walking towards the village. He too has never been traced. And then between two and four, another cavalier, this time a white one, was seen by two different witnesses parked here only a few yards from the house. At about four o'clock, Jane Sutherland came home from school. Some time in the previous three and a half hours, her mother had been stabbed to death in the house. Her nine-year-old daughter discovered the body. Superintendent Andrew Lister, how's the family now? The family are remarkably good. Uh, the little girl, who's a very bright girl, is a bit disturbed, upset, but overall they are remarkably good. Have you any idea of the motive? Uh, not, no clear idea. There, are, there is uh, indications of it being theft, but then nothing was stolen. So I've got this honestly say there's no clear motive. Well, let's take a look at the cl clues. We have a map here. Now, let's remind ourselves of the sightings. Uh, Dunrobin, there it is, on the east side of Kalboki. The red car was seen here, about four or 500 yards from the home. The white car was seen here, very close to the house. Now, you need to find the drivers. That is correct. We are... The, the two vehicles being so close to the locus at the material time on that date, it's of utmost importance that we do identify the drivers and the owners of the car so that we can eliminate them, eliminate them from the inquiry. It's a red cavalier and a white cavalier, and it's Monday, September the 24th, last year. No, I see correctly. Yeah. Now, there was also the cyclist um, on the road from uh, Cromarty, wasn't it, just outside uh, Kalboki? That is correct. The cyclist is in the same category as the cars. Despite the uh, very extensive inquiries, we have been unable to trace them. And a pedestrian on the road to uh, Kalboki, on the Dunkerston Road, I think. Again, that is exactly the same, yes. Now, do you have any other clues at all? Yes, we have one person, a male person, who walked into the filling station at Conan Bridge. It's known as Conan Bridge Filling Station, about 9.30 p.m. on the evening of the murder. He was carrying a gallon oil can, which he had filled with petrol, purchased 20 regal cigarettes, and left. He was, not, he was heard to speak and had an English accent. So he's English and he smokes regal cigarettes. Any other information? I mean, presumably it's possible that it wasn't an outsider at all. Is there anything you want the residents of Kalboki to look out for or report? Oh, yes, very much so. I would ask the people in Kalboki to think hard about what happened prior to the murder, what happened on the day of the murder, what they saw, what they heard. And what they've seen and heard since, it may be of importance to this case. We need their help, very much so, the local people. And I would ask all viewers to think hard, if they can give us anything at all that may help us in this case, and we certainly need it, then I'd ask them to ring in now and do so, and it would be treated in confidence. All right, thank you very much, Superintendent Lister. The number, as always, if you're going to ring here in London, 01 811 8055, 01 811 8055. Or you can call Northern Constabulary Direct. Here's the number, Dingwall 62444. Here's a cheque for £150,000 to be provided if you help secure the convictions of an armed gang. And here's another one for £100,000 if you can also recover what they stole. Why such a colossal reward? Well, security firms have had variable relationships with Crime Watch, sometimes keen, sometimes anxious to play down security breaches. But now a group of companies has joined together and said enough crime is enough. The trigger was the case you're about to see, the biggest ever cash robbery in Scotland. Eight weeks ago in the oil capital of Britain, Aberdeen, 
two miles south of the harbour at Alton's industrial estate. Basically, I thought they were up to something. Um, a van parked at the side of the road at that time of night, very quiet, all huddled up with dark clothing. He was about 5'8". He was a scruffy-looking man. Put a moustache, came down over his lips. Next afternoon, a Thursday, on the old coast road, two minutes from the estate, and a similar white van. He wouldn't let me past. There was nothing I could do about it. I couldn't get past. He obviously didn't know where he was going. Slowing down, accelerating. straight at me. No expression on his face whatsoever. He looked like Tosh from the bill. It was very red complexion. He looked like he'd had a good night in the town. Unshaven, dark, very untidy hair. Back on the industrial estate, where a security company has a depot for its cash in transit vans. Now the staff have got a very loyal and I'm probably a father figure. And we work as a family rather than as a, as a business. You know, and we're going well together. Well, look at this. We've got our first Christmas card. Eh? Back in December, we got our first bloody Christmas card. Sound of that. Get down the floor! Hurry up, hurry up! Hurry up! Shit, it's a raid. I've got a bloody door! Locked in the control room, all right, but the men are outside. These guys have got guns. I could have kept the doors closed, but what could have happened? And I wouldn't have went any of my crew's death in my house. You got a horrible gut feeling. Somebody's been in, they've, you know, they've taken something of yours away. You know, it's like somebody coming in, uh, turning over your house. Nearby, rush hour traffic was building, coming out of the estate. Behind the white van was a white Vauxhall senator. They turned onto the old coast road, heading south out of Aberdeen. Three miles on is the village of Port Lethem. I was raging. Yeah, I just wanted to go after the car and ask the guy what the hell he was doing. I just kept on following. He went towards Asta. Meanwhile, another witness saw the white van arrive and head towards a remote car park. When I went into Asta car park, I watched where he went. Well, I actually followed him and watched all his movements. He, like, dropped a guy off and who went into a dark blue car and I thought there was something suspicious. Well, he had dark hair. He looked like an Arab guy, like a dark-skinned. He looked to me as though he was very suspicious. Not far from Asda is Port Lethen Church. Is the girls to get on tonight? Will you bend it down? Is the girls' brigade on tonight? Who's 
let's go. He was mid to late twenties. I would have described him as being quite fat, quite clean looking. And there was nothing about the car that would have stuck out. Just a dead ordinary red escort. You know, there's thousands of them you see every day. Who was he waiting by the church? Maybe quite unconnected with the robbery. But an hour later... You be a tell, you be a tell, there are two vehicles on fire. A Vauxhall Senator and a Bedford minivan. Over. Peter Simpson, in fact, you had a huge pub response on this before the reward was announced. Yeah, it's one of the biggest responses I've ever known uh, in an inquiry like this. In the first seven days, we were really inundated with information. So you know a great deal about how to track where the gang were. Of course, now you need to find out who they are. Your concentration on this huge reward is presumably because you want to detach people who are relatively close to the gang. Yeah, this reward, I think, is really intended for someone who is close to the gang, who has some int intimate knowledge of the gang and who can give us information which will lead to their arrest and conviction. Now, how sure do you want them to be before they call? Are you talking about people who've really just heard things on the grapevine, they're pretty sure they know who did it, or just people who look like any of these four or who might have had previous for this sort of thing? We certainly would welcome any suggestions at all, uh, but if anyone has specific information which would really assist us in this inquiry, then I can assure them that that would be treated with the strictest confidence. Now, there's a local connection because the two vehicles were stolen in Aberdeen and stored there for a couple of uh, weeks but there's an English connection as well. One of the guys seemed to have an English accent. They stole largely Scottish currency. It's going to be pretty hard for them to get rid of that. That's large sums, largely Royal Bank of Scotland. Yeah, the vast majority of the money stolen was in Royal Bank of Scotland, 10 and 20 pound notes. And again, I'm hoping the reward uh, will stir someone to give us a call into the incident room or the studio here. Pretty nerve-wracking to do that. These guys threaten to kill people. They're going around with guns. People are going to be frightened about their names getting out to the gang. Well, as I say, there's been no, I've personally no knowledge of any breach of confidentiality with information north of the border. And I can certainly assure the viewers that it won't happen in this case. Well, up to a quarter of a million pounds. The person or the people who can solve this, and uh, there's no premium line phone numbers here. It's a free call, 0500 600 600. And more officers are standing by in Aberdeen. That's 01224 38686.